This video is brought to you by Filmmaker U. To learn more about the coloring process in film, be sure to check out Filmmaker U and the course featuring Mad Max Fury Road colorist Eric Whip. Get an in-depth look at Eric's workflow and strategies for developing looks that fit the film and add to the story. For more info or to enroll, check out FilmmakerU.com. In 1895, the Edison Manufacturing Company, who had a dedicated film department to support their growing kinetoscope line, produced a short film called Annabelle Serpentine Dance. The film was pretty simple by today's standards. A popular serpentine dancer named Annabelle Moore danced in front of the camera. What makes this film special is that each frame was hand-painted to display a menagerie of color. The result is still breathtaking despite being over 100 years old. Color continued to make appearances, although usually using a far faster and cheaper process of tinting sections of the film a single color, shade, or hue, such as in 1910's Frankenstein and the horror classic Nosferatu from 1922. Color in these films was more to help build a sense of dread, mystery, familiarity, or to imply the surreal than it was to do anything naturalistic. However, some filmmakers persisted in trying to present their films in photorealistic color. George Méliès, for example, hired a crew of 22 women to paint each frame of his film Trip to the Moon. Despite the effort put into the colored print, it was lost until a copy was anonymously donated to the Filmoteca de Catalunya in the 1990s. As archaic as this technique seems, it's been used as recently as 2018 for the Peter Jackson World War I documentary They Shall Not Grow Old. Using computers instead of paintbrushes, the team at Double Negative used reference stills from past and present to digitally repaint the newly restored footage. The now lost Cupid Angling would be the first North American film shot in color. Another lost film, The Gulf Between, was the first film shot with a new technology developed by Technicolor. Technicolor continued to pioneer the color film process and in the late 1930s developed what they called Technicolor 4 or 3 strip Technicolor. This is when color really began to take hold of filmmakers' imaginations at the cinema and at the box office. The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind both use this technology which uses three separate rolls of film, one capturing green, with the other capturing blue and red strips put back to back to help save space. This was a process known for its rich, saturated colors that often feel larger than life. While three strip is beautiful, it's also very, very expensive. Shooting three strip requires three times the amount of film that conventional productions require. Not to mention the specialized camera, which was controlled by Technicolor. It's for this reason that black and white continued to have a hold on the industry until the 1950s, when Eastman Color was introduced by Kodak. A single strip of 35mm color film, Kodak's new film stock was initially used for the documentary Royal Journey. Significantly cheaper than the alternative from Technicolor, after some refinements of the stock allowing for a better exposure in lower light situations, it quickly replaced three-strip Technicolor with its use in films like 1952's This Is Cinerama and the James Dean classic Rebel Without a Cause. You're tearing me apart! Throughout all of the innovation and change, the role of someone to monitor and match the color hues and tones of each shot to the next became increasingly important. Unlike today, where it's a craft of guiding the viewer's eye by balancing shades and hues, the role of the color timer was a complex job of balancing color with only a few simple controls. In those days, they used what's called a hazel keen. As you move the film over the scanner, it would put it on a, a television. The timer would have just red, green, and blue tetri knob, and so he could change the print of lights. And then what would happen is, shot by shot, it would go onto a punch tape. That was computers in those days. <laughs> And so if it ever had to be printed again, the print of lights, that's how they were, were saved. Despite the hazel teen saving the settings used on a punch tape, with every revision requested by a client or director, the color timer had to redo the project from scratch. So let's say you're doing a commercial. You do a screening, and the agency is there, the baloney looks green, or the sunset is not rich enough. So they would go back and print and print until there was a print that they liked. As technology improved and new options became available to the color timer, the art of color timing started to become less about keeping the meters consistent and more about the artistry of the image. The secondary would allow us to change the image to make it more magenta or cyan. You are doing the whole image, but you are now 
instead of just red, green, and blue and getting a balance, you are altering. So you could just take a blue and then just add more saturation only in that blue hue and change the hue of the blue so you get saturation. The ability to tweak secondary colors happened as computers began to be used in the color timing process. The release of Oh Brother Where Art Thou, the first film colored entirely on a computer, signaled the dawn of a new day for color in film, using computer software to do the work. With computers, targeting exact areas of the image became possible, as did changing the luminosity of certain zones on the image. Despite no longer needing the multi-million dollar tools to work as a colorist, the core of the job hasn't changed. It's still a role that requires patient, delicate adjustments for each scene and a keen eye for what needs to be tweaked. If you enjoyed the content in this video, don't forget to check out Filmmaker U. It's a one-stop destination to learn how industry professionals approach their jobs, like Eric Whip, colorist for Mad Max Fury Road. Learn how Eric approaches a scene, develops a look, and uses color to guide the viewer's eyes only at FilmmakerU.com.